winter is coming. I can already feel the drop in temperatures. So now I'm starting to think about brumating my snakes. So I think a lot of you are going to be doing the same. So I'm going to kick off this new series of learning from other keepers where we jump on a call and pick their brains uh, with chatting about brumation. And I'm very excited to see how people are going to react to this level of information. So without further ado, enjoy us picking the mind of an experienced keeper. Thank you for giving us your time and ability to pick your mind. Um, I'm assuming people will appreciate this watching going into winter now. I don't even think I need to introduce you, but I'll let you introduce yourself and what you keep and how long you've been going for. Uh, well, I'm Francis Coscieri. Uh, I keep reptiles, basically. <laughs> <laughs> A wide selection, but I suppose I'm most known for colubrid snakes and certain lizards, although I have... Uh, a fairly eclectic mix of species, um, but mostly rat snakes, whip snakes, coach whips, um, a few boas and pythons, but not as many as I used to have. A bit of everything, really. <laughs> yeah. M most of the species that you would likely be to be to encounter in a any pet shop, plus a few extra as well. So a lot of what you keep does brumate and you've been brumating for a lot of years as well yes uh, i actually try and aim to i mean in in the last decade or so i have almost unconsciously refined my collection to animals that do live in temperate environments for a number of reasons um one is that it does actually save quite a bit of the energy during the winter uh, and electricity when you've got all the heating and lighting elements reduced or off completely over a period of three or four months. It gives me a period of, of rest as well compared to the rest of the year. Um, so yes, a lot of the species that I do keep, uh, and I do tend to gravitate towards species that I've seen in the wild or that come from habitats that I've been to. And as, as some European, I've been to most of the European countries. I've hurt a large percentage of the European herpetofauna. So I've got a lot of European species and again with North African, Central Asian, sort of temperate Asia. Um, but also uh, I have a fair few North American species as well. So there's a lot of that that comes from to the keeper's side where it's actually a rest for the keeper to have some time off keeping everything. Yeah, I, I do put it like that, but actually it gets very lonely in the winter when I don't have um, all the animals to... Uh, keep me occupied uh, <laughs> and especially I, i'm not looking forward to it now with the uh, the covid situation it kept me sane last year just having the animals to potter around and look after so <laughs> yeah i can imagine the other years it's been more of a uh, a benefit maybe not so much recently yeah you always want some tropical species just to keep you going during the <laughs> yeah i mean I, I have a few of those as well but just not as many well there you are then so I think the first thing for us to get into is what actually is brumation? That's actually a very good question. And knowing that will actually determine whether or not you choose to deter to uh, to brumate your, your reptile, because obviously not all reptiles do brumate. Um, so just onto the question. So brumation is a type of hibernation. So everybody knows what hibernation is. Hibernation is a period of winter dormancy that various mm. animals from insects and invertebrates all the way up to many mammals undergo. Brumation could be considered a type of hibernation. Now, recently, there has been a push from some quarters to phase out the word. Um, now, the word brumation was coined uh, in the 60s, I believe, by a fellow called Wilbur Mayhew uh, with regard to desert horned lizards, Phrynosoma. Uh, and his definition was that it is a type of winter dormancy akin to hibernation where the animal undergoes physiological changes aside from the temperature. So you've got to remember that when a mammal hibernates, a mammal regulates its own um, body temperature. It's, it's endothermic. Um, so it will still, even during hibernation, be regulating that. Reptiles are ectothermic or poikilotherms. They basically are, in general terms, they are basically the same temperature as the environment around it, or rather a, a more accurate way of saying this is that they regulate their temperature within the parameters of the environment. So 
when a reptile brumates, it isn't the, quite the same thing as a mammal brumating, uh, as a mammal hibernating, because obviously their, their temperature is lowered. So in, in many more northerly climates or perhaps montane environments, they're more or less forced to undergo a period of rest. Um, and, and brumation, the word comes from the Latin bruma, winter. So it, it's, it's winter rests. Uh, and it has a counterpoint in reptiles called aestivation, which comes from aestival or aestivalis, which is Latin for summer, uh, which is a similar but different period of dormancy that some reptiles undergo during hot periods when it becomes too hot for them. That is basically what brumation is. I mean, it, it's basically hibernation um, and you can use the terms interchangeably. Hibernation, uh, brumation is hibernation. Not all hibernation is brumation though. I think that's quite important for reptile keepers to realise that it's a period of rest, not something extravagant out Side the realms of hibernation. Yes, and it's also important to remember that depending on where the animal uh, lives, what locality it's at, will determine whether or not it brumates. There are many temperate reptile species that might brumate in the northern part of their range, and I'm sure we'll get into that when we cover why brumate. Um, but they might not brumate in the more southerly parts of the range because the temperature is um, more beneficial, sort of, uh, is it's. Uh, allows them to remain active. And it's also important to remember that even in the very north, even when uh, animals get frosted over and you know snows fall, now and then the reptiles do actually awaken from this dormancy and they will actually come out and thermoregulate and drink. I mean, I'm, I'm sure many people will be familiar of the images of uh, northern adders or ring cows in South Africa out on snow and they're just drinking from the snow. Often this will surprise people that now and then the animals do actually rouse themselves from rumination in order to actually regulate their intake of water or to thermoregulate. It, it does happen. It's just at a reduced state. Leading into that now is why should we replicate this in captivity? Because you see a lot of people saying, oh, if you aren't breeding, you don't need to. But should you? And that why? Is, a, is another good point. And it is, again, a very common thing to say, well, I don't breed them. so." there's no need to brumate. And you know what, there is a, there may be a point to that. For example, if we're gonna take the most commonly kept snakes, or one of the most commonly kept snakes, if you, if you take a corn snake, corn snakes don't necessarily brumate across their range. And even when they do, you may find that um, the length of brumation may vary. It might be just a period of cooling for a month in one area, and it might be three months in another. So certainly there is, um, there is a leeway in whether or not you do brumate and whether or not how uh, this affects the health of, of a reptile will vary. However, that being said, there are some very good reasons to brumate, even if you're not breeding. But if we start with the most basic, so if we look at black rat snakes, I mean, there, there have been several studies undertaken. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the most detailed was on black rat snakes in Ontario and Maryland. And what that found was that the animals that lived in Ontario were exposed to colder temperatures and brumated for several months of the year. Those in Maryland didn't and were active more or less year round. The difference that they found was that the animals in Maryland um, matured, reached sexual maturity more quickly. So the females bred between four to five years of age, whereas the animals in Ontario bred much later, between seven and nine years of age was their first breeding. However, the Maryland animals that matured quicker also died quicker. So without brumation, they were living on average 20 years in total, mm -hmm. whereas the animals that did brumate lived 30 years. So that's a decade, that's a third of the life extra, um, just because the animals were able to brumate. Now, in the wild, there are ramifications to brumation. Brumation is a, a stressful and dangerous part of the year for snakes. We know this. Mortality is, the evidence points that mortality is quite high during brum brumation. There are reasons for that and they can be countered in captivity. It's obviously much safer to brumate in captivity if you know what you're doing because you are keeping them at the right temperatures. You don't have to expose them to the same extremes that they might undergo in you know, uh, Canada or in the Primorsky, you don't have seasonal dips and highs where a bit of 
sun for a week might bring them early out of cremation and then you'll get a, a crash in temperatures in February, which might uh, kill them. So that's the first. You, you, there, are, there is substantial evidence that at least some um, temperate snakes live longer and it's, it's a long period, it's 10 years difference. Um, and the numbers of animals this was tested on was quite high. I believe it was something that was between, I think, 580 or 590 animals just in Ontario. So this, this, that's a good number of animals this is tested on and a, a, around 200 animals in Maryland. So it, it's a fairly big um, study group. Um, so it, it's not just a uh, sort of aberrancies among individuals. So that's the first thing. Uh, similar studies have indicated that this is this may also be the case in Notekis, which are tiger snakes in the very south of Australia and Tasmania, Crotalus, rattlesnakes, again coming from North America and Canada, and Thamnophis, garter snakes. So again, we're looking at these extreme northerly distributed animals and extreme southerly distributed animals. There is evidence that it increases lifespan. And it makes sense when you consider they might spend between a quarter to a third of the year with such a low metabolic rate um, undergoing brumation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it reduces their metabolism for quite a substantial part of the year. So yeah, that you'd expect that to extend their lifespan. There are other um, reasons to brumate though. We could go into, it's, natu it's the natural behavior, it is, the fact that these animals have obviously adapted to brumate. Um, if you look at Russian rat snakes or Dion's rat snakes, they come from a very similar environment um, with perhaps even more extremes of cold temperature than you might find in Canada with black rat snakes. So it, it's likely they have the same kind of results. The, the second reason is just that you're replicating the natural behavior. Now, I did say that there is a certain amount of stress associated with brumation, but it is not maximal. So we've actually measured corticosteroid levels in brumatic snakes. And although it is elevated, it isn't actually as high as you might think. So it doesn't seem to affect them that much. Obviously, if you're breeding, a lot of the mechanisms that affect breeding happen during brumation in many species, especially in temperate uh, environments. Um, it goes down to an understanding of spermatogenesis and oogenesis or vitellogenesis. And, and what those long words means is the formation and de development of sperm in males and the formation and development of eggs or yolk in females. What that means, what that breaks down to is that, for example, in male snakes, there are different mechanisms for spermatogenesis depending on where in the world the snakes are from. And, and this is species by species, not individuals. Um, you've got postnuptial spermatogenesis, which is when sperm is formed during the warmer parts of the year after mating and is stored over winter and the development occurs then. You've got prenuptial, which is not really found in cold regions. It's, it's more completed towards the end of the breeding season. So it, it's all done in one season. You have mixed type spermatogenesis, which occurs in late spring and is completed the following year. So it requires a year um for the sperm to form prior to mating and then during autumn after mating um, and then you've also got continuous reproductive activity which is sort of seen with tropical animals and which doesn't really concern us because they, they might have although there may be seasonal shifts in their mating behaviors it's more to do with uh shifts in humidity say than it is to do with warmth and cold so with the females again um and this is quite surprising because although it seems like it's linked to breeding, it isn't. It's linked to welfare. Um, it's just that the process leading up to breeding is strongly linked to welfare. So with females, you have what's called vitellogenesis. So you've got the formation of yolk. And you would, a pet keeper might think, well, it's forming yolk. It will, it will lay eggs. If it's not breeding, it won't need to. But the thing is, this process doesn't necessarily get interrupted just because the snake isn't breeding. It happens yearly. What we found, and what might be quite surprising to some, is that the metabolic cost of vitellogenesis, the formation of yolk, and, and oogenesis, the formation of the egg, is actually higher than the metabolic cost of pregnancy or being gravid, which is quite a surprise because obviously a female growing babies inside it, developing eggs or babies, you'd expect that metabolic cost to be quite high. 
but actually it is in in terms of stress it's actually there's, there's very little um elevation of stress above the baseline and ele uh, very little elevation of metabolic cost above baseline during uh, pregnancy in, in snakes and this has been measured in boa constrictors which do undergo cooling in some parts of the of their range but not all but also nerodia american water snakes thamnophis american garter snakes crotalus american rattlesnakes. so again northerly distributed species um, you'll note that all of those are live bearing as well um, so the cost of vitellogenesis is high if it's undergone during brumation, um, the fact that the animal is conserving energy in order for that vitellogenesis to take place helps. If the snake is active, it's it's using energy, it's, it's, it's wasting energy when it wouldn't need to, that it would actually be putting towards the development of follicles and egg yolk. Um, you would have development of its liver, hypertrophy of the liver is what it's called. It's, it's the opposite of atrophy. So there is a physiological benefit to being brumated in at least some species um, and again going back to um, post-nuptial and pre-nuptial it varies from species to species this is the problem many of the species that we have in the hobby do brumate across parts of their range if you look at corn snakes hognose snakes rat snakes uh, garter snakes king snakes uh, including the montane king snakes especially so if you're looking at gray banded or uh, Pyramelana kings, they, they brumate. Many of those species may not always brumate in the more southerly states in North America. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about America because it's it's more familiar and a lot of the snakes that we're, we're keeping are from there. So it's an easy sort of place mm -hmm. to, um, to gather examples from. Plus the studies have been run there with uh, many species and actually have shown the differences in lifespan between them. So you can vary brumation. It doesn't always have to be a four or five month process as it might be in the very extreme north or south of a range. It might just be a month of cooling uh, and we'll get onto how that can be done. Uh, but to answer the question, it's not just for breeding. You are also um, benefiting the snake's physiological processes substantially to the effect that in the wild at least, in at least some populations they are living up to a third longer. And I think that's quite important to, to note. It, it's a big jump in lifespan. It's massive. Yeah, I mean, that's 10 years. That That's, uh, you know, 20 years to 10 years. It doesn't sound much to us, but that's a third extra of life. Um, and for me, that's uh, reason enough. I mean, I've got animals next to me. I've got Russian rat snakes, which exist on the Primorsky area of Russia. Uh, and, you know, there, there are animals here that are nearing 30 years next to me. In the other room, I've got animals of similar age that have been handed down to me from the likes of uh, Charlotte Wilford and Florence Butler. And again, they are long term animals that have been brumated for many years. Other benefits, um, again, going to the, I mean, I think lifespan and physiological well being have been covered. There may be a case that it may reduce dystopia as, as well, it may reduce egg binding in snakes because. The development of the eggs is allowed to undergo more naturally and with less of a cost, or rather with less of the activity of the animal uh, impeding upon the metabolic cost of the formation of those eggs. So that may be a reason why some people say they have slugging out occur, maybe that they haven't been brumated long enough. Um, that's more um, supposition, I should say that, but the other um, the other points have been tested quite thoroughly in uh, in a variety of species. Sorry to waffle. <laughs> no, it's it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I I do wonder if if we actually did a study wide study theoretically, if there would be a high proportion of slugs in those that choose not to brumate compared to those that do. That I couldn't say. It's a possibility, and I have heard from some breeders, uh, for example. Al Stotton, a very well-known UK breeder of Pituophis, uh, bull and gopher snakes, was discussing this with me just a few months ago, and he's of agreement. He, he believes that the cycling is extremely important to their life cycle, um, and it may reduce the proportion of slugs uh, or eggs that fail to develop, for, for those that aren't unfamiliar with the term. It's, it's, that's just fascinating. 
it's it's all linked. This is the thing. Um, biology is extremely efficient and complex. And when you consider how much of some of these animals' lives is consumed by brumation, I mean, if we're looking at Russian rat snakes, I, I've got some here. In the wild, these animals might be brumating five months of the year. That's nearly half the, the year brumating. So obviously, some of the animals will be physiologically adapted to undergo that process. It'll be part of their life cycle. Um, I'm not sure that if we are intending to give them good welfare, as I know that you are very keen to, uh, to champion, we, can't inc we, we shouldn't incorporate such a massive part of their life cycle into that regime. I think another thing that, that I just thought of there is that some people might think, oh, well, this breeder doesn't brumate their their corn snakes, for example, therefore I don't need to brumate mine. But what we aren't taking into account is the uh, genetic lineage of what that animal might be coming from. Yeah, there's, there's lots of factors. I'm not saying that it's the only factor that is going to affect the outcome of breeding. Certainly in some species, for example, again, Russian rat snakes, Dion's rat snakes, the animals that are adapted to an extremely um, cold conditions and long brumation. In my experience, um, these animals are far less likely to be fertile or to have far reduced fertility amongst the clutch if they haven't been brumated. And that is, that's not just unique to me. That's something that's quite well known. Every now and again, you'll get a keeper that'll say, well, I've bred them without it. Yeah, it can happen. I've bred Dion's without brumation. I have found smaller clutch size, smaller hatchling size. I have found less fertility. I found, you know, a, a greater number of eggs that never hatch. Um, but to get the really big clutches uh, and the, uh, the highest fertility and you know, the highest number of surviving developing eggs, I've always found that brumation is necessary for some of these species, not all. I'm not gonna go out and say that corn snakes won't breed without brumation because they do. You know, and corn snakes occur in places like Florida where it's summer temperatures in winter <laughs> you know, mm. in some areas. So across their range, there is variance. Um, and you also have to factor in the fact that in captivity, if they're kept well, they are provided with sufficient food, uh, a comfortable environment, correct temperatures. That's going to be a benefit. So even then, there is leeway. But for some species, uh, particularly the most northern and most southern, I believe the brumation is a very important part of their uh, husbandry. This, 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 that particular point may not necessarily uh, relate to the most common species, but certainly if you're talking mountain king snakes, Russian rat snakes, Dion's rat snakes. Um, if you are keeping any of the more northerly distributed vipers or pit vipers, I'm sure it would affect them. The more northerly garter snakes, I'm sure that it's going to be a, a factor. It's more of a case of knowing your species' natural history as well. You have to Absolutely. know your species' natural history to know yeah, what... You have to know their range and you have to know what they are like. Um, I mean, I could bring up horseshoe whip snakes, Hemorrhois hippocrepis. It's a European species found in Spain, Portugal, uh, nor, uh, across Morocco and North Africa. Um, and it's a, it's a whip snake where the range may be limited by the fact that it's not, that if it gets too cold and it is forced to brumate for more than about a month, it is unable to undergo its spermatogenesis or patellogenesis and it's unable to reproduce. So there is a line, and it's a constant line uh, across northern Spain and Portugal, sort of just hitting, I think, the island of Pantelaria. Pantelaria, it's an Italian island. Above that line, they cannot exist because their reproductive cycle uh, just doesn't work. They can undergo a period of cooling, and they, they do in parts of inland Portugal for about a month or so, but they need to be active to complete that style of um, spermatogenesis. Now, I happen to have a lot of horseshoe whip snakes. They're, they're the snakes I've been keeping the longest. I've also happened to be very familiar with their habits in the wild as I'm from Gibraltar and you get them there, they're the most common snake there and you get them across Southern Spain. If you go out in December on a warm and sunny day, you can see them, they come out and they're basking, they may even hunt, um, but they certainly are active. They're not sort of deep into the, in the rock crevices or under the ground. And that's because it's not, cold enough i believe the average temperature is seven degrees air temperature but of course the rocks are getting hotter than that if they're if on the winter sun if you're lying in the sun it still can get hot you can get burnt out there on a sunny day in winter so of course they're still using that they're coming out to bask 
if I'm therefore keeping a horseshoe whip snakes, am I going to put them in a fridge? No, I'm going to factor in the, the fact that they may remain active um, throughout the winter and instead reduce temperatures. And that will relate to how we undergo brumation. There are different ways of doing it. And I'm sure that many people watching this will have their own ways that work just as well. I'm not going to say that the way I use is the only way. Um, but certainly, if you are going to attempt to hibernate or brumate your snake, be aware of where it comes from, its, its ranges. Um, if you know, if the animal is wild caught or is from a locality that you're aware of, what is the norm for that locality? And that should be able to help guide you on how you actually choose to undertake that brumation, whether you're actually putting it in a fridge, which might shock people that yes, we actually use fridges to, uh, to brumate the, the smaller species, or if you're just gonna leave it in its vid with no light for a few months um, and no heat. So that's exactly what I did for my king snakes. It's just no light, just no light and no heat for um, like about two, three months or so, and just that. But I would like to know how do you go about brumating your different species of snakes? Okay, so if we go, I have two um, general methods that I use. If we go with the easy one, which I was just talking about, the horseshoe whip snakes. Say I've got an animal from North Africa, which or the Mediterranean. A lot of my collection is comprised of whip snakes and samophids, sand snakes from North Africa. They're species that live in Mediterranean environments. And although there is a pronounced winter drop, and in fact, it, it can get very cold in, in parts of the area, it doesn't really drop below freezing in most areas. I mean, if you look at Egypt, the average temperature in most localities will be between seven and 12 degrees, which is not all that cold. It's colder than you'd get in a living room, but it's not that cold. It is certainly cooler than uh, you, it would be if you had your lights on and your spotlights. So for animals like this that aren't actually gonna get put in the fridge and wouldn't undergo a complete brumation, as I call it, I cool them. So uh, I obviously, both involve cooling but this is simply having the lights off during the winter now there is there's more detail into how to you don't just suddenly put the lights off and, and leave it at that but that's that's one method cooling full brumation as i like to call it is a different process where you actually end up with the animal taken out of the viv and put into a cold environment usually a fridge because fridges can be set to required temperatures with some of the animals I have that are too large to put in a fridge, for example, the, the very largest rat snakes I've got, I will put them into a shed or an attic where temperatures, although are not controlled, tend to stay at the required temperature and that suits them just fine. So there are some important steps to consider before you start brumating. The first is under cold, obviously, a lot about keeping reptiles is regulating and maintaining an environment in an enclosure at a temperature higher than what is in your room. Obviously, we all have our heat pads and our heat devices, our CHEs and our halogens, our lights. The temperature inside an enclosure is set to a specific gradient suitable for our animals to thermoregulate. That's basic husbandry. It goes against the grain then to expose them to lower temperatures, especially when you can get maladies from those temperatures you can get respiratory infections if they're exposed to temperatures too long that you can get thermal shock if they're dropped too quickly it's not something that you undertake straight away there are steps to it one of the most important things to remember is that at lower temperatures the animals don't digest food or well, they don't digest it well and this happens in the wild we've, we've actually found uh, examples of crotalus rattlesnakes there are several documented instances where they've actually had constipation and fecal lumps inside the digestive tract because they've entered brumation having eaten and they've not digested and it's hardened and they've been unable to pass it. That happens in captivity as well. So the number one thing you've got to start remembering is that you've got to stop feeding these animals a matter of weeks, if not months, before you start, before you end up with them in the, in the cold. Mm -hmm. You can do that by reducing food. So around October, around now, I'm starting to reduce the food items I'll, the next um, meal i give will be young mice for example um, just so they have something and then i won't feed them again for another month at least so it should be four to six weeks without meal and i generally do this mid-october um, with a view to putting them into brumation storage in november that's six weeks 
you're not just not feeding, you're also reducing two factors. Um, so as with any other aspect of reptile husbandry, brumation is manipulating the environment. With the environment that you manipulate, you, manip you manipulate heat and you manipulate light. We know that seasonal triggers for reptiles are reduction in temperature, obviously, but also reduction in photo period, day length. That is a trigger. And anyone who knows me will know that I'm quite crazy about lights and offering the correct spectra of light and, and um, you know, wavelengths from the infrared spectrum all the way across the visible spectrum, UVA and UVB. The fact that you do this actually allows you to manipulate the temperature quite well because you start reducing photo period by an hour each day, uh, or rather an hour at the, in the morning and an hour in the evening. So if you've got a 14 hour photo period for temperate species, you change that to 12 one week. And then a week later, you'll change it to 10. And then a week later, you'll change it to eight. And in those few weeks, uh, you, you just reduce the photo period by an hour each way until you have the lights off. Along with that, you're also reducing heat. And again, this is done gradually because you don't want to shock the animal. You know, they, they can enter thermal shock, especially in rooms where the background temperature is too low. And, you know, and obviously in which case the, the heater inside the terrarium is going to be more important. Over this period of about six weeks, a month, two months, you will have then manipulated temperature and light and also reduced and stopped feeding over a long period rather than a sudden drop. And that mimics autumn. Um, it mimics the period where the animals are actually starting to look um, for a, a place to, to become dormant. Once you've done that, you will then, depending on what style of cremation you choose to pursue, if you're cooling them, they can be left there. And there are some people that I know have been experimenting with even leaving the lights on on a short photo period, say four to six hours, but no heat for species such as Malpolon, Samophis, Mediterranean species, where they will still be active. They can still come out and actually bask under the UV, but they won't have heat. The other thing you have to take into consideration is that room temperature in the standard house, I mean, in my house, with everything on, the ambient temperature is around 22 degrees. That doesn't sound like much, but to a temperate animal that is used to being outdoors in this period, it might be eight degrees outside or 10 degrees during the day. Mm. It's, it's significantly higher temperature. So although it may feel cool for you, it's not actually that cool for the animal. In such cases, uh, and particularly with somophids and hemorrhoids, the whip snakes, I do offer small food uh, items throughout the winter at a reduced rate. So I might offer baby mice, pinkies, things like that, um, but at double the interval, double the usual feeding interval. And you would be surprised at how little weight is actually lost. If anything, sometimes they actually even gain weight. It, it, amazingly enough, after brumation, you, if you weigh them before and after, you can actually come, they can come out of brumation slightly heavier than they are before going into brumation, which is... It's, it's quite a thing and uh, it, it's, it's always a beautiful thing to see them come out and looking so fresh and reinvigorated and having lost no weight. If it's done properly, brumation shouldn't have any negative effects to the animals. If you are brumating, uh, that's a full brumation, rather than leaving them in the bit for cooling, you, what you will want to do is put them into a tub um, and that tub will have to go somewhere cooler. I use a series of fridges, um, old, old, um, out of, you know, secondhand fridges, where I will put my snakes into tubs with a substrate, which is usually loam, soil, coca -qua, mixed up with some sphagnum moss on top. It doesn't necessarily have to be too damp, and how much humidity uh, will be determined by the type of species. Unfortunately, in one video, I can't go through every species and what humidity they need. That species specific, you know, if it's a species from a desert area, you're not going to have it as humid as a species from a wetland area. Some might get respiratory infection if they are kept too humid during brumation. Others might dry out if, they, if they're not kept humid enough. So again, I'm not going to presume to say that it's the same for every animal, and it varies animal to animal. This is something that experience or keeper knowledge uh, will need to be sought. I, I can't sort of give the whole process for every species in, in one video. Understandable. Once you've got the animal in the box, obviously there, there needs to be holes for air exchange. And you need to remember that when you're putting it into a fridge, 
you need to be opening that door because it tends to have an airtight seal. So at least a daily opening of the door, which you would do anyway, because you want to be checking up on the animals. Um, with the fridge, I make sure that the light is off because obviously when a fridge is opened, normal fridges, the light goes on. You need to make sure that that bulb is taken off or whatever connection is used is removed so that every time you open the door, you're not putting that light on in case it bothers the animals. I don't know whether it will, but I don't like doing it. Labeling is extremely important. You need to know the dates that you put the animals in to the fridge, what date you expect them out. You can put weights. Uh, and this is one of the times when I think weighing the animal is particularly important. I use a small water bowl as well in every uh, tub. Some people don't and they rouse the animals and just give them some water every week or so. Myself, I, I'm, I prefer just to make sure they've got water available, although you will also see that there is condensation that builds up on the sides. If they want to drink, they'll drink that. But I think it's, it's safer to make sure there's a, at least a small water bowl and that can be changed. Mm. And in doing so, it, it's, you're not leaving them untouched for four months or three months, however long you're leaving them. You need to be checking up on them because if something starts going wrong and they start deteriorating, you need to rouse them again. It, it, you know, this isn't something that you always have to see through. If you notice an animal has issues, you rouse it uh, and you can bring it back up and keep it to healthier uh, in, uh, environmental conditions and you can try again next year. If the animal is a larger animal, uh, king rat snakes, Russian rat snakes, um, Korean rat snakes, big, big, you know, anything that is large enough that is going to require a tub that won't fit into a fridge, those I will put either into an attic in my mother's house or a shed in my mother's garden. Now, the UK, where I live in southeastern UK, the weather is never going to get too far below freezing. It might drop a few temperatures, a few degrees below. But you need to consider if you're keeping this animal outside, if you're in an area uh, that drops considerably below freezing, that might not be viable. Because even if a Russian rat snake does live in the Primorsky, where it can get to minus 15 Celsius overnight, that doesn't mean that its body temperature will be minus 15 Celsius. It will inhabit the deeper cracks that don't change temperature as quickly. So it will regulate its temperature that way. And, and we do know that the animals do regulate body temperature during brumation. It's, it's not that they just stay completely still. They shuttle about and they will even thermoregulate during periods of winter sun. So it's not just a case of putting them at a low temperature. You have to choose the correct temperature. Generally, eight to 10 degrees Celsius is fine, up to 12. This is a safe temperature. It's not as cool as they might experience. I have had animals go down to two degrees and I've gone out and looked at my natrix, uh, natrix or grass snakes or Russian rat snakes and it's been two degrees outside and they're active, in there. they're not even sleeping, they're literally active and investigating their enclosure. Um, so different animals will be more or less resistant to drops in temperature and that will factor in the required temperature that you set them for. Um, with putting them outside, uh, what I was saying was, if you have them in a large tub, the large tub isn't bare, it is full of loam and soil and substrate, a layer of leaf litter on top, um, and the animals will dig into that. And what you can do, you can install sort of PVC pipes down into the substrate, and they will go down into that, and that will insulate them from the worst excesses of the cold. Um, as long as it's frost free, that's fine. They will survive perfectly well. I know that it can be daunting for the newer keeper to, to expose their, their beloved animals to temperatures like that when they're so used to keeping them warm. And it is a leap of faith often. Uh, but once you've seen it done for the first time, it, it does instill a lot of confidence when they come out and they come out with such an incredible breeding drive and such a desire to eat. And they shed and they come out just glossy as hell. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Another benefit that I kind of skipped over earlier in my ramblings, <laughs> you'll have to forgive me for that. It is a, it is a, a character quirk, but um, <laughs> no worries. Rumation can also be used to get juveniles feeding. And now this is a kind of like a little hobby secret amongst some uh, particularly rat snake keepers that are keeping things like leopard snakes, Escalapian snakes, but also matrix and European species. Many of these animals will double clutch even in the wild and they will have a second clutch around September, so late August or September, hatching end of September to October. The neonates, what is found is that if they hatch out at those times, don't actually feed before growing into brumation. 
what a lot of keepers have found is that particularly late cut clutches of these and other species, it's very difficult to get the babies to eat. I mean, I've had people with whole clutches of Escalapian snakes coming to me saying, you know, oh, they won't eat, they won't eat, what can I do? Don't worry about it, put them into brumation. Give them a cold period, um, and we haven't mentioned time yet, I, I'm sort of jumping backwards and forwards, but give them a period of winter dormancy and see how they come out the following February. And I all but guarantee you that 99% of those animals, once they come out of rumation, will eat like runaway locomotives. They, they just mm. like a different animal. I mean, this is particularly common with Escalapian snakes, in my opinion, but it, it applies to other temperate species with late clutches as well. Um, I seem to notice it's more of a European phenomenon, though. I, I don't know if I recall America, as many American keepers having the same issues with American um, species. But then again, a lot of the American species, like king snakes, may be a few generations further in. They've been bred for longer than some of the European species. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Also, their ranges may, as we said before, the range of the, these species may preclude the necessity of brumation, and they're just ad more adaptable uh, without brumation. That might also be a factor. Uh, but certainly with a lot of the, the sort of central European species, a period of brumation is a great benefit of getting babies to eat. Uh, and I've seen that with a lot of matrix, um, Zamenis, you know, uh, the Escalavian snakes and relatives and so on, and also beauty snakes. Um, um, and again, the last thing that I was going to touch on, sorry, I'm kind of like eating up your... That's fine. <laughs> We've got the power of the video, edit. But, uh, so the last thing I was going to touch on was length of time. How long do you leave them? Well, that can be anything from four weeks up to four months. I mean, my Russian rat snakes, I've kind of hit on a happy medium where I leave them between around three months. Around the three month mark is fine. I kind of miss them if I uh, leave them longer than that. But certainly in, in areas of the wild, they, they will brumate for up to five months in some areas. Um, in other areas, such as Northern China, maybe not so much. So I, I leave them at a happy medium of around three months or so, November to February, shall we say, mid-November to the beginning of February. Um, so over the, the winter period, and then around February is when I start rousing them. Rousing them is another issue. You do, again, animals can experience thermal shock. You don't just grab them out of an enclosure and shove them into their warmed up enclosure where they experience fully uh, developed summer temperatures. You have, it's a gradual process. So just as it was um, dialing them down for brumation, you've also got to dial them back up. So again, you would put them into the unheated enclosure and again, you have to remember that jump in temperature is more than 10 degrees. You know, if, you, if you're keeping them at 10 in the fridge and you suddenly put them in room temperature of 20, 21, that's already a jump. Mm -hmm. You give them a photo period, again, starting on the opposite end. So say eight hours and you start dialing them back up week in, week out, eight, 10, 12, 14 hours over a period of a month or so. And that's the same with the temperature. You start raising the temperature bit by bit every week. Um, once you've done that, most species will shed either immediately upon emerging from brumation or a few weeks later. But um, there, is a, there is a moment of time where they come out and they will shed and you will experience a fully renewed and glossy animal just in its prime. You don't have to, but I tend to wait for that to happen before I start offering food, depending on species. And again, the food, just like with the temperature and the light, is dialed up. You, um, you give them a small amount, a small prey item, maybe a, a baby quail, a, a quail chick for the larger species, or a, a young mouse, you know, and you let it eat, digest that, make sure that it poops, make sure there's no obstruction from before, that there's no sort of uh, constipation that's occurred. Offer another small meal, and then you can start increasing feeds. What you will probably find in some species is that males may not be as interested in feeding, although nowadays I don't really notice as much. I find that with the longer they're in captivity, there's more of a blurring between these natural sort of habits in the wild. A male might not eat at all for the first three or four months after brumation because its sole purpose is finding a female to mate with. This varies species by species, but certainly if you look at mountain king snakes, Dion's rat snakes, um, they come out like runaway freight trains and all they want is to find a female and mate. Um, and they will not stop moving until they do that. Uh, sometimes it's kinder just to 
allow them to <laughs> to get it out of their systems a few times and then they calm down and then they'll start eating females on the other hand i find will often devour whatever you offer them and it you know depending on species again it, I, this is a very general kind of guide I can't give for species by species with as many animals as I have but in general you will be feeding the female sometimes even at an enhanced rate so she can build up her reserves and she's ready to produce her eggs uh, and that is an important thing to remember that you don't just um, you, you can feed more it, it's not always bad to just feed them up a little bit after brumation so that they can replenish whatever fat storage they've lost so would you recommend then um that they be slightly overweight compared to normal going into brumation rather than being like you know lean lean as hell i run my animals lean i i'm but again when i say lean i don't mean malnourished or skinny um i think it's very easy to overfeed reptiles in captivity in particular if they don't have space to move around or correct temperature um, and i think it's very it can be difficult to notice this that's the problem with snakes it, it's not always easy to tell when an animal is overweight externally however i think there is a fear of overfeeding particularly in colubrids especially the active colubrids um, and there is also the problem is that colubrids, and we say colubrids because colubrids as a phylogenetic group isn't necessarily um, monophyletic. It, it's, you know, it's, it's actually several lineages. Um, if you look at Samophis, for example, they're not actually colubrids anymore. You might, you know, they're cl more closely related to elapids or, you know, they're called lamprophids. So when we're talking about colubrids, and again, most of this has been regarding colubrid snakes, they're so varied that the metabolic rates of each species will differ or genus by genus. Um, I wouldn't feed a coach whip the same way that I would feed a rat snake. And I wouldn't feed the rat snake the same way I'd feed a king snake. So again, it, it does vary. I mean, coach whips eat so much that it's very difficult to overfeed them. They, they literally just eat nonstop, but the, they eat smaller prey items in general with an occasional larger one. Um, obviously in the wild, you might see them eating a full like Protolus atrox or a, a ground squirrel, but in captivity, I tend to feed more, but more. Uh, I feed less, but more often after brumation in the run of after brumation. Yes, it's it's safe to overfeed, uh, and obviously don't go completely um, over the top. Don't power feed them, but you can feed more, and the animals will take it. Um, and especially more active animals, it will do them good. Again, with males, if you've got a male that hasn't eaten for a few months and you know it's gone through brumation, it's not eaten, it's then gone through the breeding cycle and may not have eaten or won't have eaten as much because sometimes males will refuse food. They, they might, sometimes they'll take some and then they won't the next they, it, So you've got a space of, you know, there's a, set, there's a set period of time after the breeding season before brumation where, yeah, you, you've got to get that animal fed. I'm not endorsing power feeding, but I'm not saying that it's going to be the same as if the animal was awake all year long and wasn't breeding and you were just feeding it once every 10 days, for example. You can vary that up. And again, this is down to the individual animal as well as the species. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a very rough, you know, very rough in general. Um, but again, in this case, I would seek the advice of somebody who is experienced with the species or literature showing how this species has done well, how it acts in the wild. Um, and that can give some clues. Uh, I will say that it sounds very complex, but snakes are very hardy animals. Um, it's, it's, if you're keeping them properly, it's very hard to do wrong by them. This is the, the thing. So a, a bit of overfeeding or a bit of underfeeding is going to do too much damage either way. If you're overbreeding the, the female and not feeding enough, that's going to do damage. Um, so Again, it, it is going to vary depending on whether or not you are keeping the animal to breed or whether or not you are keeping it as a pet. I do think there's a strong argument for brumation even for pet animals um, as opposed to cycling them for, for breeding. I would also, I forgot to mention this, but my method of doing this was inspired by an article by Kim Caldwell, uh, which was published in the magazine Reptilian here in 1997. I think it's it's volume four. I don't know the issue. It, I know that it had an issue of 
a Boiga irregularis, a brown tree snake on the front. Very good article. Um, I know that Kim Caldwell's cycling and keeping was inspired by Bob Applegate with his uh, draw style enclosures. I don't use draw style enclosures, although I factor in changes in humidity, temperature and lighting in my own enclosures. But I certainly make use of that style of cycling microlubrids. And that article back in 1997 was a big influence on me on the way that I actually do so. Um, and I certainly saw improvements in, in breeding success using it. So a lot of my viewers also keep uh, king snake keepers. And I see that from when they submit their enclosures to me for you to review. So you used to keep California king snakes and Mexican blacks, didn't you? How did you used to go into cycling those? What temperatures were you selecting for during winter and stuff? I was using the, the, the deep brumation method for those. So I was actually, and, and in fact, that article that I mentioned specifically did uh, cater to Mexican black king snakes and Florida kings, I think, as well as black rat snake and milk snake. So it actually did feature all of those um, types of colubrids and it, it gave dates as well it was a it was a, a good article worth looking up um so i used to use the same as that i was aiming for around 10 degrees i believe uh in the fridge with the same light period 14 hour light period obviously the technology we had back then was substantially inferior with regards to lighting um i remember there were brands like vita lights and the earlier zoomed offerings in the 90s um they were all T8 fixtures. And again, I, I used to use those. I was successful. I then moved and upgraded those to newer forms. I remember in the early 2000s, we had here in Europe, we had the Hagen Life Glow, which was very good full spectrum light. And we also had the Repti Glow, which were uh, UV bulbs of different percentages, 2%, 6%, and 10%. So I was using those. And then up until 2010, I sort of shifted again to the T5s and the Arcadia products. Um, but yes, regardless of the technology used, the light cycle and the cycling was the same. The temperature cycling was was just so. Uh, and the period of time was around yeah three months, I would say. It was I was putting them to bed in November, rousing them in February. Um, and that was fairly across the board. I might have used a bit longer for uh, Alterna. So I, I went for... The last season that I did, I went for just a soft and I just let the temperatures go down and just kept it dark for three months in the enclosure. And I was I was aiming for 15 degrees based on when I looked at weather patterns and stuff. But now I'm thinking maybe I should have gone should have gone lower, actually. Um, I, I would go lower. Um, if you look at 15 degrees, many areas uh, and, you know, I'm not saying that this is the case in Florida or California where, you know, it's, it's really hot even at night. But if you look at many areas in Europe, some of the more northerly states where some of these animals are coming from, if you go out on a summer night, how hot is it really hmm. during a night? In some areas, sure, it might be 20 degrees, 24 degrees, 22 degrees. In other areas, it goes down to 10 degrees at night, even in the summer, um, you know, which is the active period. So for me personally, 15 is actually not low enough. Um, it is a, a midway point. I'd certainly reduce it to that level as part of the decrease in temperature but i would go i mean my my what i've found to be the sweet spot is between 8 to 12 with a preference for 8 to 10 to be honest so i would say lower i would if i was going to make a mistake i'd actually err on the side of lower because if you make it too hot they might not go into a full brumation and that's when you might start seeing issues like uh loss of muscle tone because they're still active they're still metabolizing um, but they're not getting food and they're cold. So they might start losing muscle tone. Whereas if their met met metabolic rate goes down the way it should, you shouldn't see that. And that's when you see proper brumation. Um, so I would certainly err on a slightly lower side, believe it or not, by a few degrees than a slightly higher. Than a slightly higher. Mm, Cause I, I, I can't say I experienced that. So I actually might have achieved lower temperatures than that maybe. But they were definitely dead to the world for a good three months. So, yeah, I, mean, um, I certainly think it helps. I'm not going to say that every time you brumate, you are going to have animals come out and they will definitely breed and they will all definitely be fertile. As anything, it helps. It's part of a husbandry regimen. It doesn't guarantee anything. You'll still have keepers and breeders that are saying, "Oh, I didn't, I failed this year with this animal or this clutch didn't hatch," and they're still cycling them. But it is. 
increasing your chances. Uh, and I believe it benefits the animals, um, certainly in longe longevity, possibly in um, yearly development and metabolic rest. Hmm. So now I'm going to re rejig my plan for this winter now, I think. <laughs> I mean, if you can find a, an energy efficient secondhand fridge and you put a min max, obviously you've got to test it if it's secondhand, if it's not your own. Yeah, exactly. Put a min max thermometer in there first to make sure that it does actually calibrate to the right temperatures. You don't want to have a broken thermostat in the fridge where you've got it set to 10 and it's actually at two or zero. Um, but if you can find um, a good, cheap fridge, try it. Um, you might be surprised. Uh, I've actually got my um, my incubator does the opposite. It does cooling, so that goes down to like ten. Yeah. Or down to the minimum it goes down to is five, so I could use that. I yeah, don't know whether they anything with a thermostat that controls the temperature. It doesn't have to be a fridge. It's, it's all the same thing. Exactly. Um, all you're doing is controlling the temperature. So I think that's what we're all aiming for. Really, we're all aiming to have the longest living, healthiest animals. And producing yeah. the healthiest offspring for as long as possible so Absolutely. i think this has been an absolute amazing resource for anyone that wants to actually look at this in detail rather than the casual video and this is far more detailed than i was hoping this was going to be so thank you this has been <laughs> this has been brilliant and i think this is going to be brilliant for people when they get to see this a pleasure <laughs> so thank you for your time and thank you for coming on because this has been brilliant no problem at all <laughs>